Good morning, everyone. This is Melton Demir from Digital Currency Group. We are so excited to have you here today for our webinar on Decentralized Exchange, the Future of Crypto Asset Infrastructure, featuring Radar Relay. We are going to get started in a few minutes. So for now, kindly ask that you hold tight, and we will be back in just two or three minutes and get started with our webinar for the day. All right, we are back. So good morning, everyone. We're excited to have you here for our webinar on Decentralized Exchange. Before we get started, I just want to handle a few quick housekeeping items. Because we have quite a few people on the call this morning, um, we are going to have all attendees in mute mode. However, we love having this be interactive, and we want to encourage you to ask a lot of questions, to ask for clarification as it's needed. So you can use the chat function in your GoToWebinar control panel. So if you look at the control panel, there's a little chat pop-out. If you click on that, you can send messages to the organizers directly or to all attendees. If you have a question you'd like to ask, feel free to send it to all attendees or directly to the organizers. And we'll make sure that we ask the friendly radar relay folks we have on the line with us. That being said, we're going to go ahead and get started. So for today's webinar, the agenda is as follows. We'll start with a brief overview of Digital Currency Group. We are the organizers of this webinar, and we are also investors in Radar Relay, the company that's going to be presenting the future of crypto infrastructure to you. We're very excited about decentralized exchange and decentralized infrastructure more broadly. It's a key component to ensuring that digital currencies stay accessible. And I think what the Radar Relay team will share with you some of the reasons why decentralized order books and decentralized exchange are critical to maintaining the health of the digital currency ecosystem going forward. So I want to quickly introduce everyone to Digital Currency Group. At Digital Currency Group, what we do is we build, buy, and support digital currency and blockchain technology companies by leveraging our insights, our network, and our access to capital. So what does that mean? First and foremost, we have three operating subsidiaries, including Genesis Trading, an over-the-counter broker-dealer that trades with institutions and high net worth counterparties. They trade Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum, Ethereum Classic, and a number of other digital currencies. We have Grayscale, our product business, which has created a variety of digital currency investment products, including the Bitcoin Investment Trust, the Ethereum Classic Trust, as well as the Zcash Investment Trust. They currently have over $2 billion in assets under management, and as of this week, announced a new and interesting stock split for their primary product, which is the Bitcoin Investment Trust. So lastly, we have Coindesk, which is our media, events, and research platform. Hopefully, some of you have attended a Coindesk conference or are regular readers of Coindesk. 
We also have an investment portfolio. So we invest in companies using typically the traditional venture model where we'll invest in an equity round. But with the recent trend of tokenization, we've also begun investing in companies through tokens and cryptocurrencies. Some of the notable companies we've invested in include companies like Coinbase and Ripple, as well as newer companies like Ledger and Axoni. Again, Radar Relay, who's going to be speaking today about the future of decentralized exchange, is one of our newer portfolio companies. Lastly, we also invest in digital currencies directly. We list all of our currency holdings on our website, www.ccg.co, and we also have a token disclosure policy where we've clearly laid out when and where we'll disclose the investments we've made in new cryptocurrencies or new token projects. So again, we have a diversified strategy, and our goal is really to support the development of the digital currency ecosystem. With that said, I'm really excited to have Radar Relay here with us today. I've been playing around with their DEX or decentralized exchange a little bit. It took me a while to get the hang of it, but I think the UX or the user experience is by far better than I was expecting. I have to admit that I myself for a long time was highly, highly skeptical of the decentralized exchange business model, but Alan and his team at Radar Relay, Relay pardon, have done an absolutely amazing job, and I think you'll be very impressed with what they have to share with you today. So with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and hand today's webinar over to Alan. I'm going to be asking him a lot of questions, what I like to do, and if you have any questions that you want to contribute, please feel free to chime in using the chat function. So again, everyone is muted. If you try to talk into your phone, unfortunately, we're not going to hear you. Please go ahead and use the chat function to ask questions, to ask for clarification, to let us know if you can't really hear very well, and we'll do our best to get all the questions answered during this webinar. Do note that we will be recording this, and we will be sharing the recording afterwards on YouTube, so it's readily accessible, so you can review parts that may have moved a little too quickly for you, or share it with your friends or colleagues. All right, let's get started. So, one moment. I am not technically the most savvy. Surprising. <laughs> and, Alan, I'm handing over to you. Cool. Thanks, Maltum, and good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining. For those of you who are up early on the West Coast, really appreciate it. We're excited to be here, excited to be working with DCG, Maltum, Casey. Thanks so much for, for organizing. I think the webinar is, is a good venue, good medium for us. Um, I've been told many times I've got a face for radio, so uh, webinars in particular are an effective place to tell bad jokes and not hear the groans on the other side. So. Really looking forward to, to walking you guys through a pretty tight agenda. Um, we've got about 50 minutes here and seven different areas we want to cover. The thought being we move through it in about 20, 30 minutes or so, and then all you folks listening in, save your tough questions, your hard questions for us at the end, and we just rapid fire go through them. So I'm going to cover introductions. So who's talking? Who's here in the room? What's Radar up to? walk you through our exchange thesis, how we think about this evolutionary transition happening in the exchange categories. Double click on radar, zoom in a little bit how it works, look at the protocol 0x, which enables relayers. Mike will walk you through a demo, and then we'll, we'll cover what's next coming around the corner in terms of roadmap. So um, the team, so who's here in the room? So I'm Alan, I'm on the left, I'm CEO. Uh, my background has, has largely been uh, on the management ops side. So prior to, to working at Radar for the last three years, I was the program director at a large tech incubator here in Colorado, where Radar is based. I was there for three years, had an opportunity to work with, with dozens of startups who came in with an idea on a napkin, and we helped them raise money, build their team, get to market, that kind of thing. It was a great experience to find mentors, uh, find great founders, but man, it was tough being a, in the passenger seat, and I was really excited uh, to drive, and so I so I left radar and, and jumped over to, or left industry, jumped over to radar. Now the other two folks, other two better looking guys, pictured next to me, uh, Caleb, our strategy officer, has spent a few years at Coinbase solving hard machine learning problems prior to um, jumping ship for for radar. And Mike, our CTO, who you'll be hearing from in a little bit, very similar background, computer science in particular, but with a heavier focus on application development. So that's a little bit about who we are, but I think it's important to understand the, the radar 
origin story if you want to understand where we're going. So rewind, rewind the tape uh, a few crypto years all the way back to June of last year, June of 2017. And the three of us and, and a few other guys here in, in Fort Collins, which is about an hour north of Denver, we were spending nights and weekends and, and all of our free time thinking about hard problems in the, in the blockchain space. And if you, if you imagine sort of looking in, being a, a fly on the wall in that room, you would see that there was really two specific problem sets that we were laser focused on, on solving. The first being the security breaches and the friction of centralized exchanges. Some of us had lost funds. Um, some of us had been burned pretty bad, in particular Mike, uh, being in the space for, for so many years. That was problem set one. Problem set two was around token access. It was pretty mind boggling to me that this token economy that we're all so excited about and pushing forward, we can't get DApp developers the tokens they need when they need them. And it's really hard to find metered access to, to, to these tokens. And so those two problem sets were, were banging around our head for a while until Caleb, who at the time, you know, full time at Coinbase, he introduced us to Will Warren and the Xerox project, Xerox protocol. And for us, it was love at, love at first protocol or love at first white paper, um, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but we saw that the wallet to wallet um, open order book model that we're going to describe here in a little bit was exactly what we needed in terms of a solution to solve both the security issues inherent in the centralized exchanges that were frustrating us and also provide the, the meter token access um, to, to dApps. So, so if you imagine, Again, back in June, read the white paper, get excited. We decide, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna launch a little splash page, let people know we wanna, we wanna build a relayer. So August, early August, uh, all of us, fingers crossed, launched a splash page outlining what we wanted to build. We went to bed thinking, hey, it'd be really neat if maybe somebody covered this on Reddit or got on Twitter. And the next morning we woke up and we had 10,000 hits on the site and hundreds of followers in a very vocal um, user base or vocal, very vocal fan base. So we looked at each other and we realized it's time, time to quit our day jobs and, and make a run at this thing. And so that was in early August. And by the end of the month, so early September, we had a testnet beta up of, of Radar Relay. For those of you who were there during the testnet beta, um, thank you and I apologize. Um, <laughs> then very quickly, um, a month later, we, we got to mainnet so that would have been October, uh, and then the month of November was dedicated towards raising our venture capital seed round. The month of December was, was focused on staffing, building out our team. So there's three faces here on, on the team page, but that's not even close to the, um, the amount of people that have been on, uh, in Radar Nation making this happen. So uh, maybe last, last thing I'll mention in, in terms of, of the journey we've been on is it's really been driven by community input and community feedback. So, for example, a lot of the features coming out from testnet to mainnet were people in the community chiming in in our Slack and, and tweeting at us to build a chart like this or add this functionality. So thank you uh, for, the, for the, the community. And I wish there was a way for me to put a community on the team slide um, because Radar is, is bigger than, than just our little team here. Cool, so uh, how, Meltem, I just got your message on the audio. Can you hear me okay? Yep, yep. I think you're just a little choppy, and then um, let's, let's move into some of the guts of how Radar oh. Relay works. Totally. Give us the goods, Alan, give us the yeah, goods. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so if you, so if you um, jump forward into, uh, into how, we, how we decided to build Radar, how we decided to architect it, it's really dependent on our thesis of how the exchanges and how these categories are morphing and transitioning. So for all of us on the line and, and for all of us in the crypto space, I'm sure we've used many different centralized exchanges. There's over 180 of these all over the world. There seems to be a new one popping up um, every week. And the user experience is, um, is pretty straightforward. You create an account. Yes, the account can be difficult to create in terms of KYC, so know your customer, um, standards around uploading your passport and a selfie and your proof of address and yes it costs some money to deposit but on the flip side you get a faster trading experience you're trading directly with that exchange because you are giving up custody 
But on the other hand, we all know tracking the news headlines over the last uh, few years and really over the last few weeks in particular, the amount of hacks seems to be accelerating at an accelerating rate. And in fact, those 180 centralized exchanges are seen as targets by bad actors. And we've, we've fallen prey to a few of those, uh, frankly, um, in the past. And, and anytime there is a problem in the market, there's an issue, there's a pain point, creative entrepreneurs are gonna find solutions. And so this centralized exchange category has evolved or has transitioned into a new category of decentralized exchange. And the catalyst or the spark that allowed that to happen, that transition was the smart contract and some of these other escrow services. So for example, I've got the Ether Delta logo there. Some of you have, have used may have used Ether Delta. Some of you have, may have used other decentralized exchanges, but the, the UI is um, is pretty pretty similar across the board. It's, you're depositing into a smart contract. You are giving up custody to a smart contract, typically created by that decentralized exchange. Of course, you get the benefits of improved security, decreased risk of, of lost funds, but you are now beholden to the Ethereum um, settlement times and trading times. Um, one other thing to, to mention about um, sort of this jump between centralized and decentralized is that the smart contract was the catalyst and we've been waiting for this catalyst or, or this spark to move or to transition this, this space forward, the exchange space forward. And we are excited in June to connect with the Zero X team and find that with the Zero X protocol. So we're gonna dive into what the Xerox protocol is here in a little bit, uh, but at a high level, it'll describe what's, what's happening in the relayer space. And yes, we do have our logo up there. We are one of the first relayers um, to, to, uh, to build, but we're not the only one. There's probably a dozen plus that are um, actively moving from testnet to mainnet through closed betas. And what does it mean to be a relayer? What does the UI look like? It's even simpler than the other two categories. Users trade, directly from their wallets. There's no custody exchange, there's no user funds held by the relayer, it's truly wallet to wallet. And it's this thesis or this, this evolution that has got us really excited um, about launching and, and building out Radar Relay. So um, I'm gonna use uh, the next few minutes to sort of give you a high level insight on the, the user uh, interface and, and some of the highlights of Radar, but Mike's gonna walk you through the demo the real detailed version. So I've mentioned uh, uh, how we think about relayers, but what's really unique about our interface is that it looks a hell of a lot like a traditional interface. So if you visit RadarRelay.com and you, and you come and you kick the tires, you're gonna find something that reminds you of the other exchanges that you've used. And that was purposeful. We wanted people to feel at home in this new category, in this new space. We've already got some educational challenges around some of the steps for onboarding. So it didn't make any sense to, to really reinvent the wheel with, with a, a UI. So user, interfa you, user interface is pretty clear. Sign an order cryptographically, and we display that just like a bulletin board. So think of radars, um, a glorified, really pretty bulletin board. Uh, and then that order is settled by another peer directly on the Ethereum blockchain via the smart contracts that Xerox has created. So I know there's probably a bunch of questions you guys are thinking about over there, and I'd love to um, wait to answer some of those until you've seen Mike's demo. So um, maybe, maybe one other thing on, on Radar in, in terms of some of the highlights that we've worked on recently. You know, I mentioned how fast we executed from testnet to mainnet, uh, and lately we've been really focused on Integrations with wallets. So we just launched the Ledger Hardware Wallet integration, which was a, a massive leap forward for the decentralized exchange space, um, allowing people to, to not just use MetaMask, for example, to trade with us. Uh, another exciting accomplishment uh, has been onboarding tokens. So I think we're right around 100 tokens onboarded, and um, we're, we're really excited to offer the long tail support to a lot of different ERC20 projects that uh, have a hard time finding their way onto centralized exchanges. So um, that, that, um, that was a fire hydrant on our product. Now I wanna tell you a little bit about the architecture and what is so important um, about this relayer space and that spark that I was mentioning earlier. And if I could have one ask for, for the audience, it's not to go and, and try out Radar. Um, yeah, that would be nice. But the big ask 
is to go look at the ZeroX protocol. Go visit their site, go look at the docs, look at all these exciting relayer projects in this ecosystem that's being built around ZeroX. Um, I think once you do that, you'll have a much better understanding of the magnitude of excitement that this relayer category offers uh, both automated traders and, and retail traders and dApps. So what the heck is the ZeroX protocol? It's worthy of its own presentation. Uh, so I'm just gonna touch on a few of the head headlines, a few of the cliff notes here. I'm really just gonna hit three things. So number one, I've mentioned this a few times, but the ability for users to cryptographically sign orders directly from their wallet to wallet is piece one of the Xerox protocol. Um, piece two is the ability to, uh, is the suite of smart contracts that Xerox has created and they've wrapped them up in, in JavaScript and they've made them real easy, just like Lego bricks or Lego blocks for us relayers to put together in, in novel ways, novel use cases to power the on-chain settlement that we're so excited about. And then piece number three, uh, which is the, the reason we were all jumping up and down about Zero X back in June, is the fact that Will and, and the team over there is thinking really hard about governance. And they have this strategy or this methodology of planning with the end in mind. And they recognize there's gonna be a world where it's not just radar and a few dozen relayers, it's hundreds of different Zero X participants and dApps and um, trading bots and uh, we're all sharing we're all sharing liquidity and so they they're working towards a world in, in which governance is really elegant so i'd encourage you guys once you've checked out zero x to follow along with um, their team as they release more updates on how they're thinking through governance all right so alan this is melton here i am going to be um the fly in the ointment here <laughs> as i as you know i often am so um, i think it's great that you're building on top of zero x but one of the arguments that i kind of worry about is doesn't this create a lot of dependency for Radar Relay where you're completely dependent on the Zero X protocol? Can you talk a little bit about the implications of building on top of another protocol, the implications of what the interaction between Radar Relay and the Zero X token is and what that means longer term for scalability and growth for the Radar Relay project? Sure, sure. Um, yeah, so a few different places we could start. So um, at a high level, I think the mental model of building on top of a platform is, is uh, evidenced through like uh, uh, Facebook and Zynga, Twitter and Meerkat, um, all the platforms building on top, on top of Twilio. And so there's kind of this piggyback uh, business strategy that we've already taken advantage of where the community or the tribe that's been built around Zero X, the other, the token holders who are really excited, were our first 1,000 true fans. And so at a high level, um, we're really excited to be attached to a, a project um, with with such a vibrant community already. Second, zooming in a little bit, the the ability of the Zero X team to continually ship products, engage with their developer audience is pretty un, unprecedented in the space. I think I saw yesterday that they've got one of the highest amounts of GitHub activity. I think they've got some of the highest amounts of developer activity. Just yesterday, uh, the CTO of Zero X facilitated a call with the whole developer ecosystem, and we worked through some of the improvement. Um, improvement ideas, improvement protocol standards that all of us relayers are working towards. So in terms of like execution risk or, or um, their team not executing, not a concern whatsoever. And then maybe the third piece that's most exciting to me is their focus on, call it lean development. So V1, so zero X V1, which we're built on today, there's scaling issues, there's um, some trading issues, there's a, a bunch of different small things that need to be resolved. But the fact that Zero X is already targeting a V2 release imminent over the next few months, I think is a great example of how they're constantly iterating to solve some of those problems. Now, long term, your question is around dependency on a protocol. Um, what's really neat about V2, and I'm gonna be stealing some of the thunder, I think, from the Zero X team on, on their release, is they've got some really creative ideas as to how to reduce the dependency on Zero X itself as a token for using relayers and other Zero X participants. So let's flash forward a quarter or two quarters from now, and some of the pain points around holding Zero X as a token today will not be an issue uh, for us relayers. So we recognized that was going to be the case when when we um, you know got married to the protocol back in June, but no issues on on our mind in terms of what's coming next or scaling. Got it. Thanks, Alan. Um, well, I'm excited to actually see Radar Relay in action. 
So um, I know our attendees probably are as well. And attendees, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat. Again, if you have any questions, if there's anything you want Alan or the team to talk about, feel free to use the chat function, and I'll make sure those questions get asked. So back to you, Alan. Looking forward to seeing this bad boy run. Cool. Well, I'm going to hand it over to Mike, our CTO, to do a quick demo. Thanks, Alan. Hey, everyone. As Alan mentioned, I'm the CTO of Radar. Although Alan's time, he's probably used up a lot of the time with his cheesy jokes. Yep. Um, I'm going to squeeze in a five-minute demo here that just walks through the app, specifically the steps required to get set up, set up for trading, and then some of the features unique to Radar. Apologies, just a second. You know, it's amazing that we live in a world where we can have decentralized exchanges, but we can't have webinars or videos that work. I love it. <laughs> it's the future. All right, are you ready now? Yep, all set. All right, let's do it. So you can get to the app by visiting our website, RadarRelay.com, and clicking on the Open App button on the nav bar or the Trade Now button. Unlike a centralized exchange, we can bypass logging in and depositing, and we can go straight to connecting our wallet. For this demo, I'm going to I'm going to use a Ledger hardware wallet, but you can also use a Chrome extension called MetaMask. So after plugging in, we select Ledger in the Wallet tab, and then enter the PIN to unlock the Ledger. Once it's unlocked, the app will automatically load your token balances. There's a few safety measures unique to relayers. One of these is setting a token allowance. You can think of this as enabling or unlocking your tokens. It basically ensures no third parties can trade your tokens without permission. To enable a token, click the toggle in the wallet drawer. Every Ethereum transaction requires gas to execute, so when sending a transaction, you need to set a gas price. Cheaper potentially takes longer, or if you're feeling impatient, you can spend more for a faster transaction. So we'll create the transaction and then confirm it on the ledger. Now the transaction has been broadcast to the Ethereum network, you can click the link to view the pending transaction on the Etherscan. And the transaction was finalized, so now the token is enabled for trading. For more in-depth explanation of token allowances, you can check out our tokenallowance.io page. Another cool aspect of decentralized exchange, or more specifically a relayer, is that you're trading directly with other wallets instead of private liquidity pools. For this to work, every token being traded between wallets needs to be compatible with one another. That's where this new term, wrapping, comes in. When wrapping, you're taking ETH and wrapping it inside of an altcoin so you can trade it with other altcoins. So we'll enter an amount and then keep some unwrapped for gas, free, gas fees and then click wrap. Again, we need to submit a transaction. What's happening here is we're sending unwrapped ETH to a smart contract and we're getting an equal amount of wrapped ETH back. So now it looks like the transaction's gone through. So we should have wrapped ETH show up in our wallet. We have a weth.io page if you're interested in more information on this as well. So our wallet's connected, our ETH wrapped, and our tokens are enabled. We have three different options for placing trades. The first is selecting an order on the book. I'm starting with this option because it really displays the wallet-to-wallet -wallet aspect of Radar. So we'll notice the order handler is now changed to display the order details. This is a single order placed by someone else, so you can buy this order directly from their wallet. It auto-populated. 43 ZRX, because that's the max I can buy for 0.08 WETH at this order's price. Then if I wanted to execute the trade, I'd simply click the buy button and confirm it on the ledger again. The second trading option is a market order. Market orders on radar are similar to other exchanges. However, the main difference is that we actually batch multiple orders from individual wallets to satisfy your order. With the current orders on the book, I could purchase about 37 0x at 0.07 WETH. 
I don't have enough WETH in the wallet, but if I was able to purchase more, it did highlight multiple rows in the order book. Again, if we we're going to execute the trade, we would just click buy and then confirm it. The third option is a limit order. For a limit order, you can set the trade amount and the price. You can also click the last trade price below the input to set the price. Now I'll place the order, and this should bring up a confirmation and an option to set an expiration date for this order. Now, because we're placing a limit, we're not creating a transaction. We're merely signing an order with our wallet and placing it on the book. So let's submit that. Unlike a centralized exchange, Radar Relay doesn't use a matching engine, so if you place an order over or under the spread, they won't be automatically filled unless another person fills them. If you have open orders on the book, you can view a snapshot of them in the wallet drawer. There, and you can also click on an order in the drawer to show an in-depth view of that order. You can also go over to the account page for a detailed view of all of your orders and your trade history. So one last cool feature of Radar is the ability to share individual orders. If we look at the book, you'll see the share icon next to the order I previously placed. Clicking on this will copy a unique order URL to the clipboard. So we can open another browser tab and then paste that in. Now we have a shareable order with the ability for anyone to fill it directly on the page. You can paste this link into social or email or send it to a friend. All right, that's pretty much the gist of using Radar. Thanks for watching. So that was a ton of info. If you have any questions, um, just hold up. We have just a couple more slides, and I'm actually just going to hand it back over to Alan here. Cool. Thanks, Mike. So we'll, we can jump into specific features, and um, we can do some hot fixing or bugs if you guys are into that kind of thing in the Q&A period as well. Um, so last slide, and then we, we'll, we'll flip it to, to questions. So what you've seen so far, what you've heard from Mike and I, is really just the tip of the iceberg of what we're building here. What we've executed on in, in just four and a half, almost five months now, um, is nothing compared to what we're excited about launching here in terms of automated trading and offering uh, world-class API for our liquidity providers and offering localization. So we've we've already translated our content across a dozen languages and we're working through how to how to go to market in, in foreign markets and what does it mean to have a marketing team and a support team. And, um, we're, we're thinking really hard about how do we provide a liquidity layer for dApps, right? So if, if you guys are, so if, um, if Meltem's building a, a, a dApp and she's got her Meltem coin or Meltem token and um, her users in order to engage with her product have a different token. And we need to build a way to abstract away the complexity so the user has a really managed and frictionless experience. And, and we believe the, the Radar API and the open order book liquidity that we're building will solve that problem for dApps. Um, and last, and I think most importantly, maybe what most questions will be about is around scaling. Um, how do we get this thing humming when in the face of CryptoKitties, uh, you know, everything seems to, to sort of come to a lull. And we've got an entire division on our team led by Caleb, who's sitting here next to me, that's really focused on what's coming next in terms of scaling technologies, whether that's cross-chain or looking at um, state channels. Um, we're focused on being the first to explore some of these new scaling technologies. So um, that was the, the fastest we could fit the radar origin story, show off the demo a little bit, and we did it in under 40 minutes. So what I'd love to do is, is either answer questions here um, in the remaining time, or if you don't catch me or you want to go deeper, my email is on the screen, and I would love to, to find time for a quick chat with, with anybody uh, who participated. So Meltem, I'll, I'll turn it over to you to help triage. I have so many questions, Alan. Um, <laughs> some of them are my own questions. Some of them are attendee questions. But let's start with one attendee question. So Phil Francis from 3.0 Capital um, wants to learn a little bit more about the 0x token itself. So what is the actual utility of the 0x token in the context of a DEX? Sure. So for us, it's the governance function I was mentioning earlier. 
and our ability to meaningfully vote or, or vote with our tokens, if you will, for protocol level improvements. Um, so that's of primary importance to us and the ZeroX team. Um, the other piece of utility that the most relayers have been excited about is ZeroX as, a, as the fee token. Um, however, in comparison, the utility of the governance function is, is primary. Got it. Thanks for that. Um, next question from Scott Sue at Canaccord Genuity. Um, where do DEXs stand in regard to liquidity? And this is a topic you and I have talked about quite a bit, Alan. You guys had an amazing peak day where you crossed over 10 million in daily traded volume. But we're seeing now that volumes have come down since. There's been a little bit of a cooling off in the market. What do you think liquidity will look like going forward? What's required to grow liquidity? Um, talk to me a little bit about where you see that evolving, what you think the key catalysts will be, and whether or not you think there's an opportunity for market makers or whales to start to manipulate order books. Yeah, sure. So our strategy for liquidity is, is getting Meltem to tweet about us. It's worked great in the past. <laughs> so, uh, no, but in, in it did all, work really well. In all seriousness, um, if you rewind back to uh, November, December, when our volumes were, were really around, hovering around maybe 250, 300,000 daily, uh, and we were really working with you know a, a few hundred manual retail traders, and then the word started getting out, you know, via Meltem and, and a few other influencers in the community, and people started pouring into liquidity into a few select pairs, which pumped up the liquidity as Meltem is describing. Wait, wait, Alan, Alan, what were those pairs? Let's just quickly talk about that. Yeah, that, it's really two pairs in particular, um, and there's no need to avoid it. First pair number one was Spank Chain. Um, if you're not familiar with Spank Chain, Google it. Um, the second uh, pair was 0x, which makes sense for, for the tribe that, that we've built around Radar. So I think that's a great example of some of the liquidity challenges is it's all been retail to date. So for the, the question um, for liquidity to grow, it's gotta be from automated traders. And right now in the next quarter, in the next two quarters, it's going to be the more innovative early adopter liquidity provider market maker types that are moving from centralized exchanges and they wanna dip their toe in the water. So I would say- Wait, so wait. Alan, let's go back to the, the Spank Chain example. So why is it that Spank was getting so much volume on Radar Relay? Is it the fact that it wasn't even... Yeah, so let's do a post-mortem. Post-mortem on Spank Chain. Um, so a few things. First of all, the few individuals that um, had uh, maybe the, the largest sort of influencer community within the Spank Chain project are also friends of, of Radar, um, or users of Radar, and so they were, they were evangelizing in their respective social communities, and so that was a, a big magnet for the platform. And second, liquidity begets liquidity, and we had a few large orders come in, and when, you, when folks looked on um, you know, some of the spec chain order trackers, it was Radar, and so we got a little lead early, and, and then it just grew. So likely, uh, we'll see that a few more times happen with, with different projects, as post token sale, but that is not how you grow a large exchange business. It's gotta be on the automated side. So right now we're getting, oh man, I'm, I'm probably getting a dozen inbounds per, per week at this point from large trading operations who have kicked the tires on our API. They've got questions, they wanna build some bots, they wanna bring their trading strategies into this, um, into this new category, but it's kind of a paradigm shift in, for, for them. And, and how they think about you know, self-custodianship. So I think the biggest challenge for liquidity is not the awareness of the category, but in fact, the actual usage of the API, the back testing, and then the execution of, of bots building on, on us DEXs. And it's not just radar. There's a variety of decentralized exchanges that automated traders are, are coming in and they're looking at um, trading across or making round trips around the, all the different DEXs that are out there. Well, let's let's talk for a little bit about the institutional side because this is an area I know we have a lot of people who represent crypto funds and institutions on the line. Um, one key question here, and this is a tricky one, is in a DEX environment, how do you deal with KYC issues? Um, how do I know that I'm not trading, for example, with the North Korean government? This is a question from um, Alex Walsh. 
at least the centralized exchanges, they've onboarded and collected some info from participants. But in a DEX world, um, how do you deal with that that challenge? Sure. Yeah. Let's let's talk about regulatory. Um, it's an area that I get really excited yeah, about. So um, you get excited about regulation, Alan? Oh man, you're sick. <laughs> I do. It's true. Um, so right. uh, I'll try to I'll try to keep it brief. So. Way back when, uh, back in June, when we were excited about building this thing, instead of just shipping it and building it and thinking if we build it, they will come, we actually brought everything to a grinding halt and we called our, our friends over at um, our, our legal firm and we spent a lot of time, money, effort, thinking through the regulatory environment as it relates to centralized exchange, as it relates to decentralized exchange and relayers. And the reality is an open order, well, open order book relayer like us is not holding user funds and does not meet the criteria of many of the regulations that apply to decentralized exchanges that do act as the taker, do have a smart contract that receives deposits. So we're, we're really comfortable with our SEC, our FinCEN, our CFTC strategy, and we've spent a lot of time um, understanding the precedents in the past and what they're likely, how they're likely to think about us, our little software business moving forward. So for automated traders and retail traders alike, because we're never taking custody of your funds, you're, it's just a bulletin board and it's just wallet to wallet. So we don't pretend to have any need for KYC. We don't pretend to know um, what the incentive Right, is. but wait, hold on, Alan, I wanna stop you there. So I think there's definitely the legal argument that could be made that look, we're just a software provider. We're not a financial services provider, an MSB or a money transmitter, but, practically the burden of compliance is still going to fall on large institutions, right? So how can institutions utilize the liquidity of a DEX or some of the functionality of a DEX while still maintaining compliance with regulation? Because I don't think that a Goldman Sachs could say, hey, we're going to trade bank chain on a, on a DEX and that would be okay with the regulators. How, how can the, to those two paradigms fit together? Or are they completely intractable and non-compatible? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, you're describing the next quarter of my life, which is dedicated to understanding that relationship. When, when we first launched Radar, our large leap of faith, what kept me up at night was, can we meet these automated traders? Will they get excited? And we crossed that bridge. That leap of faith was, was proven to, to be not a non-issue really quickly. Now the large leap of faith is, how do you move the Goldmans of the world or even some of the OTC desks? How do you get them excited and then compliant with um, trading on radar? So I'll tell you right now, most of the, the innovative firms that maybe some are on this call and um, you know, if you're sitting in front of a whiteboard, you could probably write some of the names down. We're talking with their compliance teams, trying to understand their view on that reality that I just shared with you around being a software business and not a money transmitter. So, I think what you'll see from us is you'll see a really loud and noisy announcement, maybe a medium post or something similar, when we feel like we've effectively solved for that concern that you have. But it's not gonna happen with just our team talking to our lawyers. It's gotta be the folks on this call, the market makers on this call, reaching out to us and spending some time working with their legal team to understand. Um, so it's a, it's yeah. a joint. You there, Alan? Sorry. Yep, yep, that was it. That was just wrapping up saying it's it's a joint effort and we're not gonna have the, the panacea for, for these large, large funds tomorrow. I think we're gonna be moving towards it over the next few quarters. Yeah, absolutely. I mean I'm I'm certainly in agreement with you that decentralized infrastructure is going to be here to to stay. Um like I said, I I know when we first started chatting, I was very skeptical of, of decentralized exchange and relayers. Um, but I think certainly seeing what you guys have built has given me a lot more confidence. Um, but I do think a lot of the legal questions and some of the regulatory models that we have probably need to adjust slightly. And that's certainly a collaborative process. Um, not an enjoyable one, although it seems like you enjoy it, which is odd, but good. Um, so I actually want to ask a personal question, and this is one we've talked about before, um, stable coins. So... <laughs> We, we have had many arguments for the attendees on the call um, about stable coins, and I'm still not convinced why stable coins need to exist. But I know, Alan, in a decentralized exchange environment, um, you've spent a lot of time thinking about how stable coins may fit into the long-term picture and creating an environment that's suitable for institutional traders. Talk to me a little bit about 
what you're seeing in the stablecoin ecosystem, how you think they fit into the world of DEXs, and what projects you're seeing that you think are interesting or exciting. Sure. Yeah, I'm not surprised this question came up, Meltem. We are, we are certainly expecting you to ask about it. Um, I think on the, the first time that I met Meltem on a phone call, we were like 10 minutes in, and she just busted out, tell me your thesis on stablecoins and how they'll evolve. So, um, so at a high level, um, we are tracking each of the stablecoin projects, right? So I think there's like seven or eight at this point that have either launched or oh my, in development. There's seven or eight. Why? Why? <laughs> No, no comment. Um, but I, but I will say the for us, we think about radar as as a very much a, a meritocracy, very much a sandbox by which other stablecoins um, can uh, can come in and, and add denominating pairs or add base pairs to rate. So, for example, right now on radar today, we have Dai uh, makers Dai as as a um, as a base pair, so you can either trade against Ether or you can flip the books and, and trade against Dai. Um, and for us. Because we don't touch fiat, because we don't touch USD, and we have no intentions to do that, we see stablecoins as the simplest way to smooth out some of the inherent volatility of moving, or you know, round trip centralized to decentralized exchange and back. The other reason, and Melton, this is I think where the the heated debates have come up between you and I, um, is that this is what our automated trading inbound liquidity providers are looking for. I would say a lot of the calls we get. Folks are asking us, hey, when, you know, when die, when Basecoin, when, when are we going to have fragments? And, and so for us, it's part of appeasing our user demand or our customer, customer demand. So that's a, a two-pronged answer. Um, but I, I know you've got pushback, so hit me with it. Well, so, so my hypothesis has always been, I think stable terms in the short term could be interesting, but if we truly believe in a world where crypto assets become reserve currencies and become globally accepted, then in a fast day, existing crypto asset like Bitcoin or Ether would effectively be the stable coin, right? The volatility we're seeing today is not going to persist forever, especially as tokens become more widely distributed and the store value use case, particularly for Bitcoin, becomes more widely accepted, right? And so my hypothesis is, number one, I think um, creating a decentralized algorithmic central bank or, you know, um, creating an algorithmic way to maintain stability is really, really high risk because your incentive then as a market participant is to run the bank to zero and short it, which I think is mathematically possible in a lot of the constructions of these stable coins. But I think the bigger piece is, like, you know, we are in the middle of a paradigm shift. So while today I think the concept of a stable coin sounds theoretically appealing, I think in practice I don't see why we need a coin. Like we don't have USD plus stable USD, right? USD because of its... Um, its wide distribution has been accepted as sort of the world reserve currency. And so arguably in the crypto asset ecosystem, I do think we'll see an equivalent emerge. What do you think of that? Sure. I, I think your, your hypothesis is um, based on a, a lot of data and, and we've got our hypothesis. And this is the beauty of running these early projects in such an early space is we can rapidly A-B test who's right. And yep. one of us can call the other one and say, I told you so. And We'll make, product, <laughs> we'll make product decisions that reflect our DNA as sort of the product leader and we'll quickly iterate and remove what's, what's not working. And um, there's no allegiance to an idea or a concept. It's, it's very much a meritocracy. And I think the next well, year what, we'll play it out. It's so fun. Yeah, well, and I mean, look, I was, I was wrong on decentralized exchanges. I was very bearish on DEXs. In fact, one of the conference call attendees is texting me saying, Nelson, what happened? You told me you didn't believe in DEXs. And I said, well, I hadn't met Alan and the Radar Relay team. And what you guys have built from a user experience perspective, you know, is, is great. So who knows? I hope I'm wrong. But I look forward to continuing to talk about this with you guys because you're much closer to the issue, obviously, than I am. Um, let's move on. We have a few more questions. So Nathan Blueball asks, um, does each Relay layer and relayer need to sign on, quote unquote, to share liquidity, or is liquidity automatically shared once they're using the zero X protocol and wrapping tokens? Sure. So um, this question is related to what we call internally networked liquidity, which is the phenomenon very similar to network effects by which relayers can share each other's um, each other's liquidity. So I think it's important to understand there's two different there's many different types of relayer strategies. 
that will be built with differing trading mechanics. But right now, there's really two two camps. There's the open order book camp, and, and there's the closed matching engine. And I think we're we're already seeing. Um, I believe the uh, ERC DAX relayer is already using our API to host our um, our order book and our liquidity. And I think that's a great example of um, this network liquidity concept being executed on. And because Radar has zero fees right now, um, largely to decrease friction and, and um, not create additional hurdles for people to try it, there was no fee discussion, there was no negotiation on those fees. Moving forward, we definitely, especially with the version 2.0 of um, Zero X, we definitely see a world where relayers work together to negotiate fee structures and, and um, may even put some of those in a smart contract um, to ensure um, accuracy and, and uh, execution of the right fee schedule. And that's that concept of network liquidity, I mean, that's such a foreign idea for a lot of the decentralized exchanges and centralized exchanges out there. And it's another tally in the benefits column, another take in the benefits column of, of the Zero X protocol. Got it. Um, I, I, that actually prompted um, another question for me. So right now, one of the challenges I think for me, and I've tried using Radar Relay, and I, the experience is great, but one of the problems is, gosh, they're like everything you do has a fee associated with it, and you have to pay some gas, and then you have to wrap your ether, and it's a complicated process, and there's a lot of friction. And right now, um, gas is pretty expensive. How do you see Ethereum's scalability challenges or the rising um, cost of gas playing a role in the usability of Radar Relay? And do you have any plans to sort of reduce or limit that dependency other than hoping that the Ethereum development team comes up with um, some good scalability solutions pretty quickly? Sure. Yeah. Well, I keep texting Vitalik to turn the gas down and he doesn't answer. So I'm not sure what's going on. <laughs> Um, but okay, but so, maybe you should send him a cat T-shirt and see ah, if, that, if that motivates him. I hear that's the way to his heart. <laughs> so um, so so two things. So first of all, when we get people knocking on our door or talking about, hey, I've got to um, turn on token allowances or wrap my ETH, and man, that sucks. It's it's a hard step. It's a hurdle. We actually think counterintuitively that we we love that and we like creating some confusion in our users because it means that we have an opportunity to educate them and create this new category. And so we're actually leaning in to that. And we want to flip the narrative on wrapped ETH as an inconvenience to wrapped ETH as an asset, as an ally for you around your security and your privacy. So we've started to create some content like weath.io, tokenallowances.io to try to get to that world where people see it as a luxury and an opportunity to be safer. So that's the um, the high level. Now, specifically around scaling, um, we've got, so I just flipped to um, one of our backup slides here, back pocket slides. This is what Caleb is focused on, is how do we increase throughput, but how do we do it while simultaneously maintaining the security that we've you know, committed to our users to provide? So there's a bunch of technologies here on the screen, um, and if somebody wants to, to dive in, I'll, Caleb is happy to, to chat about each of them. But I think in particular, um, the the project that we're most excited about for, for short-term or, or near-term scaling improvements is what the Cosmos team is working on around cross-chain. So I would encourage folks on the call who are um, skeptical of, of radar scaling or skeptical of other relayers and DEXs scaling to go kick the tires on, on some of the work Cosmos is doing. Got it. Yeah, Cosmos has been a really interesting project to follow. Um, certainly, Jay Kwan, I think, is uh, exceptionally clever. Okay, we have another question from Alex Walsh. Um, has anyone given thought to an off-chain DEX, or is that just crazy talk? Um, off yeah, so, so, DEX. So, so we were just in, uh, I was just in Berlin uh, at a workshop hosted by the Web3 Foundation, um, where they organized a whole bunch of DEX founding teams to get together and talk about hard problems. And that was something that came up, um, and I, I believe the answer is yes, um, I'm trying to recall who who had the the white paper sort of cliff notes on that project, but I do think that's um, that's the type of innovation that we're not going to get to until us relayers have sort of broken the four minute mile, if you will, and, and achieve scale with an off chain order book on chain settlement, um, because the the security is, I mean, the on chain piece is 
is where the security improvements are at. So, so Alex, I would encourage maybe Alex, you could shoot me an email and we could schedule time for a for a deeper conversation on that. Awesome. Well, with that said, um, we've had a bunch of great questions. We've had a great dialogue so far. Um, I think we're getting to the end of the hour here, and obviously we're going to post this all on YouTube. Hopefully this starts a longer conversation about DEXs. Really amazing to finally see a demo. I had never really seen a demo of a DEX before um, until I used Radar Relay myself, and I think the video you shared today, um, Alan and team, is really helpful. Final question um, before we head off this call. So 2018, we're entering a really interesting year in the crypto ecosystem. I think it's always fun to ask, what are your three predictions or your three wishes for this year? So from the world of Radar Relay, in the world that you're operating, what are three things that you're hopeful for, excited for, that you wish would materialize and why? Give us something to be excited about. Sure. Yeah. Um, these are not, not going to be in order of, of uh, magnitude of, of hope, but I think in the short term, um, something this year we're really excited about is the Ethermint, um, the, is Cosmos in particular, and, and exploring Ethermint. I think that's a, a near term. Um, I think a... Um, sorry, sorry, um, wait. So if people want to learn more about Ethermint and Cosmos, where should they go? What's a good resource? Give us some tips here. Uh, I think a lot of the, for example, the white paper and some of their developer docs are just on their on their splash page. Um, this is probably the best place to start. And they've got a Slack channel that developers can can jump in. So, so that'd be the near term priority. I think the medium term priority for us would be working alongside the Zero X team and getting Zero uh, version 2.0 across the finish line. Some really exciting improvements there um, to the protocol, and then. The, the big lofty goal and the big leap of faith for us right now is dApps continuing to execute or even get to market and engage with us for, for the liquidity layer, use our API. So that third one is probably what's keeping me up at night the most is dApps, other, pro, other decentralized applications getting to market and needing what we have to offer. And I think Q2, Q3, there's a lot of projects that are supposed to be launching. So that's what we're excited about in 2018. Amazing. Well, I think there's obviously a lot to look forward to. I'm certainly very excited about Radar Relay. I've been using the DEX myself, and I find it very intuitive, very easy to use. Um, if people want to get in touch with you, if people want to build with Radar Relay, if institutional traders on this call want to get involved and learn more about how they can utilize your code, um, what's the best way to do that? How should we engage, and how should we follow up? Sure, sure. So I think three ways. First is you can email me, alan at radarrelay.com, or if you want to go take radar for a spin, app.radarrelay.com, or alternatively, if you're a DAP, if you're a trader, um, would love some feedback on the API. Um, we're, we're already, we've, it's been out for probably a little over a month at this point, and we're, we're constantly iterating it to meet the needs of, of our automated trader users. So um, would love any and all folks to chime in. Um, I've got some free time uh, tomorrow to follow up with everybody. So hopefully I'll hear from some of you guys soon. Wow, amazing. Well, really appreciate you taking the time, Alan and team. Really appreciate all the work you put into this. I will say from a design perspective, you are orders of magnitude above and beyond most of the projects we've seen. Um, I think engineering tends to be a very, very strong suit of many companies in the crypto space, but I think people always forget that in the PM space, design is just as important and sometimes just as hard as engineering. So I'm really happy to see that you have a keen eye for design and are obviously prioritizing the user experience as well. So with that said, I want to thank all of the attendees for joining us today. It's been great having you on the line. Apologies for some of the last minute changes with the webinar. We just wanted to make sure we had room to accommodate everyone. And we'll look forward to sharing this webinar on YouTube in the next few days. So feel free to refer back to it. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to contact Alan, alan at radarrelay.com. If you have any questions for DCG, we are always reachable at info at dcg.co. That's dcg.co with no M at the end. And we look forward to seeing you on the next webinar. Have a great morning or great afternoon, wherever in the world you may be, and we will see you soon. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Meltem.